right, well, we're going to uh, we're going to read Isaiah chapter 53 this morning. That's where our text is going to come. 54, I mean. <laughs> I titled my message this morning Singing in the Rain just because of the first <laughs> verse. But I know that was an old. I'm not into musicals. I don't I can't stand musicals, actually. But I know that that's a very popular Amen. musical and a lot of people really like it. So I probably ought to not be going around talking about musicals. But uh, anyway. Sabrina said, no, you didn't offend me, dude. I don't like it either. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think the whole premise of the, of, of the idea is, is that, you know, typically a rainy day is a gloomy day. But they were out there singing in the rain, right? Even though sometimes times are gloomy, even though sometimes things are dark and depressing, you dealt the hand that you dealt with, right? And so the idea is to don't let it steal your joy and to be singing in the rain, all right? And so that's really the first verse of Isaiah 54, it says to sing. So here we go. Isaiah 54, verse 1. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that did not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Now, a little bit in here, I want to go ahead and just kind of give a little bit of commentary from time to time, because I'm not going to obviously preach the whole chapter but what he's talking about is he's talking to Israel. He's talking about the fact that she's like a barren woman. She's like a barren wife right now where she is in the time frame of her history. I haven't written on the board in a while a, a time frame. And I'm going to try not to overdo it and spend too much time on it. But, you know, a lot of times I'll start with the fall. And then from the fall, we, we have the history of the flood. Now, we don't have... We can, we can approximate dates on these, on these issues here, but we don't really have archaeological evidence to do that. Somewhere a little bit before Abraham, we have the Tower of Babel. And then it was Abraham, we start having some, some legit, pretty legit dates. And somewhere around Abraham was about 2000 BC. All right. And then from there, the next episode we have from God gave Abraham promises and he told the covenant promises that foretold of the day of Jesus were given to Abraham. And then from there, God made a nation out of Abraham. We talk about that a lot and I'm sure some of you may be getting tired of it. But, you know, it was from Abraham's offspring that the nation of Israel came into existence. Abraham had a son named Isaac and he also had Ishmael, but Isaac was the promised seed and and then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau, and through Jacob came the 12 sons that were known as the 12 tribes. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and that's where the name Israel comes from. And those 12 tribes became the nation of Israel. Uh, whenever there was a famine in the land, whenever the boys were, were literally alive, and we know the story of Joseph. It was during that time frame that Joseph was taken captive in Egypt and actually became a leader. And God used him to save the nation. I, always, I preached a message one time talking about the Judah seed. The point being is that even though there was a famine in the land, God had pre-prepared Joseph to be in Egypt so that his posterity, which means his people, his seed, could be saved, but even more specifically, right in the middle of the story of Joseph, there's this story about Judah and his seed. You have to go back and read it. And I realized at that point in time, why, Lord, did you put Judah's seed in the middle of all this? Because the Judah seed is talking about Jesus. Ultimately, there's the salvation and the preservation of the seed of Judah. Yes, the seed of Israel, the people of God, but at the same time, more specifically, the seed of Judah, which would be Jesus which is where the Christ or the Messiah of the world came from. And so approximately the time frame of Moses and, and both of these, Abraham and Moses, are kind of in our story a little bit, even though they're not mentioned, are, are having to do because once again, the promises were given to Abraham and then the covenant was made with Moses, the law, before he brought him into the promised land. That was about 1450 B.C. And God told Moses, I'm not going to get into it too much right now, but there's blessings and there's curses attached to whether you're obedient or disobedient when I bring you into the land. And then from there, they became the nation of Israel. And God ultimately, at some point, gave them David, which was the greatest known king, right, of all time, about 1000 B.C. And then after David came Solomon. And we won't, I don't have time to get into all of the details, but... <clears throat> Solomon was disobedient towards God. He built altars to false gods. The result of that was that there was a split in the kingdom. Judgment came on the nation of Israel. 
became the northern and the southern kingdom. And so the northern kingdom uh, was known as Israel. Okay. It uh, means northern. The southern kingdom was later known as Judah. Comprised uh, Benjamin and Judah, the tribes of Benjamin and Judah, and then the other ten were the northern kingdom up here. This time frame here is known as the kings. It's during the time frame of the kings that also we read about the prophets. The prophets were used by God to constantly give the same message to the people of God while they were in the midst of disobedience. Because of Solomon's actions, the Bible repeatedly says that this king followed after the, his father Solomon. Meaning that for the most part, the kings of Israel didn't follow after God, but instead followed after the false gods of the world. Because of that, it caused sin to be rampant in the nation of Israel. And God would send the prophet as a voice of him saying... You need to turn from the ways of the world. You need to turn from your wicked ways or else bondage is going to come upon you. And the enemy of the north, which is which was uh, Assyria, took the northern kingdom of Israel. Assyria was higher up and so was Babylon than Israel. And there's all multiple warnings that their enemy from the north would would bring them into captivity. And. In 722 B.C., about that time, Assyria took the northern kingdom into captivity. And then it was a couple hundred years later, not quite, about 586 B.C., that, the, that Babylon took the southern kingdom into captivity, known as the Babylonian captivity. And for 70 years, the southern kingdom was in captivity to Babylon. And there's a lot of spiritual implication to all of that for the life of the Christian. But one of the things, I said all of that just to make the point that Isaiah is prophesying during this time frame. Essentially, through the ministry of whenever the northern kingdom has already been taken, and there's a warning that the same thing's going to happen to the southern kingdom. And so that's what, that's what Isaiah is prophesying, approximately somewhere in the 700 B.C.s, and he's, up, and he's prophesying to Israel. And so when he says, Sing, O barren, you that did not bear... And he goes on to say that break forth in the singing, cry aloud, you that didn't travail with child for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. So what he's talking about there is that whenever God made covenant with Abraham, it was as though he was making he was promising himself as a husband to Israel. <clears throat> and then even furthermore, if we understand a little bit about the Jewish wedding, I didn't really plan on getting into all of this, but. If we understand a little bit about the Jewish wedding, there's like a there's a betrothal process that takes place where the husband goes to find the wife and, and he and he it asks her to be his wife. But then there's a legitimate contract that's made. And, and, and you can look at the law that was given to Moses as the contract. You know, are you but because the, because it wasn't consummated at that point in time. And the question was, were you going to be faithful to the husband until he came back to get the bride. And there's a whole lot of New Testament imagery here, but we're not going to get into that right this second. But the point being is this, is that God had already promised to make her his wife. So legitimately she was. And, and then he had actually entered into contract or covenant with her through, through the law of Moses. But he had said before in Deuteronomy, before he brought him into the promised land, he said that if you're obedient, then there will be blessings. And if you're disobedient, then there will be curses. And Israel had become disobedient. But the promise is, is that the married wife, the pro which was represents what God had promised through Abraham. OK, what was was God, that the later the latter was going to be more abundant and blessing and more fruitful than what the married wife had been. So, in other words, even though there was a time frame of desolation. Even though there was a time frame of captivity, which they're currently experiencing, God was promising that there would be a great time of fruitfulness afterwards. All right. And so and then the Apostle Paul even quoted this. <coughs> We're not going to go there, but we talked about it a little bit in the book of Galatians regarding these covenants and that there's a that there's a hope and prosperity for Israel in the end. Amen. And we know that. God's not done with Israel because we cannot say that the fruitfulness and the promises that God has for Israel specifically have already come into existence. Yes, they've already been given some of their property back. And yes, they're a nation again, which is a great 
fulfillment of prophecy in and of itself. But they are not, they have not fulfilled the promises that God said would be fulfilled in her. That And much of this chapter speaks of the future time whenever Jesus will come back and rule and reign during the millennial reign of Christ. And he will rule and reign from Jerusalem and he will be the king of kings and the Lord of lords upon the earth. I mean, he is that now, but it's going to be literal when that happens. Then he, he goes on to say in verse two, enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. I mean, all this imagery, we don't, we don't get it because, I mean, I don't know. I don't like to camp, but it has to do with a tent. That's what they lived in. They lived in tents. Stretch out your curtains. Lengthen your cords. Right? Make it bigger. Strengthen your tent pegs. Make, make your habitation bigger because I'm about to bless you. I'm about to prosper you. For you shall break forth on the right hand and on the left. Your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, one of the things that I would say <coughs> is that whatever is good for Israel is good for Christians. That's it. Amen. And there's a lot of times in our life right here in that last scripture when he says, be not confounded. You shall not be put to shame for you shall forget the shame of your youth. You shall not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. How many times are people paralyzed by their past? How many times is it is it true in the life of people that they have a difficult time moving forward because they're living with so much guilt from the decisions that they made in the past, yeah. from the things that have taken place in their past, right? And because of the fact that they don't really know what the Word of God says about them. It doesn't mean that people... Never, first of all, you got a whole world full of people that are, that are bound up, that have made, made mistakes. They don't even know why they're guilty. I've told the story before how I can remember one time vividly in my mom's living room on Elmwood Street, Lafayette, sitting on that section, whatever that sectional couch was that we had in the living room, and thinking to myself, I am so guilty right now. Why am I so guilty? Now, this is going to sound silly, but I thought to myself, because I was doing all kind of bad stuff right then. But in my mind, I said, man, I hadn't stole anything in two weeks. I hadn't, like, cheated anybody. Why do right now, in this moment in time, I can remember it was palpable. Why do I feel so guilty? And it was because I had not entered into a relationship with the Lord. And I can tell you, I know that to be the case. Because that night, and I've told that story many times, that I walked up to that altar in that church in Berwick, Louisiana, and gave my heart to the Lord. That burden that had, that had plagued me rolled off of me. Amen. At the same time, even after I was a Christian, and many of you can attest to this, that that burden tries to get back on you. We, we, we start to measure our Christianity based upon our obedience or disobedience or based upon our faithfulness. And the enemy is all too quick to try to condemn us and to speak to us and tell us that we're guilty. And, but the Lord says right here in verse 4 to Israel, you're not going to remember your shame. You're not going to remember your past. You're not going to remember the, the failures of your past. And it's important for believers to be able to get to that place in their life that they're no longer paralyzed by their past. They're no longer plagued because the enemy will constantly listen I, I had done a lot of bad things when I was in the world. And one of the things that the enemy always whispered when I didn't know any better, and psychology would tell me the same thing, you're always going to be this way. You're never going to be any different than what you were because that's what they would teach, that this is how you were born. No, I was born again. I'm not going to be what psychology says. Amen. It doesn't mean that Christians don't ever make mistakes. But what I'm here to tell you is I'm no longer a slave to my past. I was born. Yeah, you could say I was born one way, but it wasn't just that I was born an alcoholic like my daddy, Jim. No, I was born a sinner like my daddy, Adam. And the problem is, is that it was a sinful nature. And the prescription was that God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. I was talking with somebody the other day. <coughs> they called me up. And they said, man, I just went through this situation and, you know, they, they want me to go see this particular psychologist to prove to them that, that I'm better. But what I told them was, is that psychology and the Bible don't, don't go together. And the person that 
they told this to said, well, that's not true. You're never going to convince the world that psychology and the Bible can go together mm -hmm. because they don't know any better. And they think that because they take psychology of man and they paint it with a little bit of scripture that thou, now they've made the two to coincide. But the main point that I would make is that I've already made it is that the difference in the philosophies between psychology and really we're, right now we're talking about addictions because this scenario is connected to that. It, it, because pe because nowadays in the modern psychological society is that if you were born an alcoholic, you'll always be an alcoholic. If you were born a drug addict, you'll always be a drug addict. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says something completely different. It says that you were born and you were born with a sinful nature in Adam. But when you're born again, you become a partaker of the divine nature. That's the problem that we have in the church. I really didn't mean to get into any of this. I thought this was going to be a 20 minute message. That's the problem that we have in the modern church today. I even have a book on my shelf that I got from one of the Bible college students at Brother Swagger's. And I can't remember the exact name of it, but it was psych. It had to do with the psycho theology heresy. Like there's an amalgamation. You know what amalgam is, right? It's like when you take two metals and you try to put them together. When you amalgamate something, I'm pretty sure that's what amalgamate means. But they are trying to amalgamate psychology with theology and, and and the church has embraced this because whenever they don't have answers for people they're like well you just need some Christian counseling and I'm not saying that all Christian counseling is bad but if you're taking pieces of psychology and trying to add Bible scripture to it then now you've got something that's neither one <laughs> because the two are not the same amen all right so what am I was my main point my main point to all that is is this is that God changes things, amen, and, 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 and that we don't have to walk around under a cloud of guilt. And that a long time, even as, after I was a Christian, because I didn't know what the Word of God said about me, I carried so much of my guilt from my past, and it weighed me down. And I never thought that I would ever be able to be anything different than what I had previously been. You know, like in other words, I was always going to fall to the trap. I was always going to fail. And what the word of the Lord was trying to tell me is, no, that's not the case. Because you're no longer under that dominion. You're no longer under that slavery. That's the past. There's a new life in Christ. Amen. 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 He says in verse 5, For thy maker is thy husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. And a wife of youth, when you were refused, says God, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. So you see there, for a small moment, I forsook you. You didn't feel me. I remember Robert used to talk about that a lot, a lot, a lot back in the day when we first met. You ever, you ever imagine the Lord just pull his hand back a little bit? Just, just a little bit and kind of like, because we don't realize whenever we start to walk in some level of victory, and we start to feel some freedom. We don't, we don't, I don't think that we think about what's really going on in the spiritual realm. Right. You may not, people may not like this, but I'm here to tell you, you do not battle against flesh and blood. Yeah. Everything that you see on this earth physically and you sense with your senses, that is not where your battle is. This might be a little too spiritual for the modern church, but I'm here to tell you what the truth says. There are fallen angels and demon spirits that are constantly attempting to thwart the plan of God and to destroy the people of God. And when you see things manifest in the physical realm that are affecting your life, I can assure you there are demon spirits and fallen angels that are behind those forces attempting to cause frustration and, and failure in the life of the believer. Okay, and so what, what the point that I'm trying to make is, is that if the Lord would remove his hand a little bit and allow, a, and allow a flood of evil to have its way, sometimes for a greater purpose, in order to get the child of God where they're supposed to be, Amen. we would know real quick the difference between what we're experiencing. And so the same goes for the believer that may be struggling, whatever he is in his life. It, the Lord can bring deliverance like that. The hand of God, the power of God can bring deliverance like that. There's no match for demon spirits and fallen angels against the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> 
He says, uh, For a small moment I've forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. With the everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, says the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I mean, if you get a picture of what's going on in that verse 11, he says, you that are afflicted, tossed with a tempest, not comforted. You get, I get a picture of a, of a ship on a sea in the midst of a tempestuous storm. In other words, there's instability. You understand what I'm talking about? Let's just break it down real simple. It, unstable. You ever, has your life ever been unstable? Have you ever seen instability in someone else's life? Don't forget whenever you feel as though you're stable and you look back on somebody else's life that looks unstable, that maybe there was a time in your own life where you had instability. Nothing, there doesn't seem to be a true foundation. I can remember a time in my life when things were so unstable, so erratic, falling apart, tempestuous, moving here and there, to and fro, no, not knowing where, where I was going to lay my head the next morning. It was such a mess. It was so much confusion connected to my life. And that's basically what's happened to Israel right now. They're in captivity. They're not even in their own home. They're over here in another nation. Things are not the same as what they used to be. There's no familiarity. Everything's strange to them. But God gives a promise. He says, but I'm going to lay a foundation for you that's going to be like jewels. That is definitely talking about the millennial reign of Christ. We see in the book of Revelation that there's a wall that's made of various layers of jewels. There's coming a day when, when Israel, amen, or at least as representative of heaven, where Israel is going to be settled finally and have peace and, and be on a firm foundation. For the Christian today, Jesus is our rock. Jesus is our firm foundation, amen. He's the anchor that holds beyond the veil, the book of Hebrews says. In other words, there may be a great storm in people's lives. There may be a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. But the word of the Lord says that we can be rest assured that there's an anchor that holds beyond the veil. It cannot be moved because Jesus accomplished his work. He went to the Father and he and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Yes. Amen. Yes. It says, and I will make thy windows of a gate. It's another way to say most scholars believe that was a ruby. And thy gates of carbuncles, that's another form of a gem, and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. I just got a picture of that this morning when I was reading it again. <clears throat> I got a picture of, you know how Jesus told the disciples, suffer not the little children? And you can see these little pictures, sometimes paintings of Jesus sitting in a, on a stool or a stump or something like that, and got some little kids around him. You know, and whenever I go to Mexico, every time I go to Mexico, God is like, well, you got to teach the kids Thursday night. Or you got to teach the kids Saturday night. And one of the things I noticed about this guy, Pastor Ramon, I mean, y'all know I don't mind teaching kids. Actually, I mean, I volunteered to do that. But Pastor Ramon, to him, it's like a big thing. Like, and I mean, it probably should be. I'm thinking he's probably right. It's like, to him, it's like an, an honor. It's like just, it's as important as the adult service. You, you're teaching the kids Saturday. You know, and and I see the picture of Jesus sitting there saying, suffer not the little children, let them come unto me. And I see Jesus like holding a Sunday school class. Right. And teaching these these little children the ways, the ways of the Lord. And, and it just I don't really know why, but I just got that picture this morning and it wasn't really part of my message. But I kind of wanted to mention it to you because it goes back along with things that the Lord's put on my heart before when I've preached, whenever the importance of. Of us teaching our children the ways of God. How God, I don't remember exactly where the scripture was. I think it's in Genesis 18 that really stuck out to me where God said, I have made myself, I'm paraphrasing, but I have made myself known to Abraham. I've allowed Abraham to know me that he might teach his children after him to know me. 
There's a purpose in God's plan. God expects that his people that follow him will teach their descendants about him. You can't make your children serve the Lord. You, you can't. The God, I mean, I said this before, but God doesn't have grandchildren. All you can do is teach your children the ways of the Lord. Amen. All you can do is take every effort that you have to, 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 to teach them and to make, them, make it available to them so that they would know the ways of the Lord. And then whenever they become of an age, they're going to have to make a decision. But it says right here, and all your children will be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness shall you be established. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for your sake. He's saying, I'm going to be your defender. I'm going to be your protector. Behold, I have created the smith that blows on the coal. So that's a, another way for, he's saying, I, I created the blacksmith. You know, the guy that's over there got that little thing, he's over there, he's, he's getting the coals red hot so he can stick the metal in. I created him. He's forging something, but I made him. And I made you, basically is what he's saying. I'm the creator that brings forth an instrument in his work. I have created the waster to destroy. He, he's created all of these things. He even said that in the New Testament, that all things were created by him, talking about Jesus as the word, and for him, that he might, that he might have dominion over all. He says, and I, this is one of the main scriptures that I really also wanted you to see. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment Thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Father, we just thank you once again for your word and pray that you'd help your word to become alive to us and that it would strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a lot had happened in Israel from the time frame that God gave Abraham the promise even until the giving of the law, and then a whole lot had happened from the time frame of the giving of the law to where we are in this book of Isaiah, right? Before God had allowed Joshua to bring them across the Jordan, he had promised that if they obeyed, they would be blessed. And if they didn't, that they would be cursed. And they had disobeyed God's word. And they had fallen into sin. And there's undoubtedly a living thought that remains for the believer today. If Israel was the follower of God, the believer of God, and Christian is the follower of God, there's a time that each and every one of us can remember, no matter how long you've been saved, for me it was only two weeks after I got saved, that I can remember being disobedient with the Lord. Each and every one of us in this room at some point in time as a Christian has failed God in some way, shape, or form. And the purpose of Isaiah has meaning for God's people today. Amen? It, 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 the primary purpose was to remind his people, the readers, that God has a special relationship with them. They had this book in this chapter reminds them that even though they had failed God, God wouldn't fail them. Israel was his covenant community, his covenant people. They were the only nation on the earth that carried his name with them. And in that sense, Christian is also his covenant community. A people, I say community, because it's, you know, you know what a, a community, it's a group of people that have something in common. We usually use the idea to describe a community or a neighborhood. What they have in common is they all live in the same place. But in this sense, there's a common union. The common union is that we're all connected to Jesus and we're all connected to one another. How are we connected to Jesus? How are we connected to one another? Because the gospel message says that he died for our sin. And that those that respond by faith become one with him. And when we become one with him, the Holy Spirit makes us one together. We become his body. He's the head. The old man born of Adam dies in Christ and is buried with him. A new man is resurrected to newness of life. Yeah. Amen. And now that's our common union. We're different than what we used to be. We were first born of Adam. Now we're born of Jesus. We were of the world. Now we're in Christ. We used to be in the kingdom of darkness, but now we're in the kingdom of light. So therefore, in that sense, we are the community of God. We are the community people of God. We bear his name in the midst of a fallen 
world. And, 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 the, and we all have a common purpose. Look at Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. This is our common purpose. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The world is seeking things to be added unto them. The world is seeking things to add to themselves. Right? Even believers that follow after God have desires and concerns in, in the midst of their heart. Things that they want, things that they desire, things, emptiness, things that they want filled up. But what the Lord's saying is, is now that you're my, you're my community, now that you bear my name, you need you to seek first the kingdom of God and my righteousness. And I'm going to take care of all the rest. Amen. may not be exactly the way you wanted it. Amen. might not be as much as you wanted. But I will take care of the rest. And that connection to God is based on His promises. The connection we have to God is based on His promises and His covenant. And God remains true to His promises. Even though they had failed God, God was the same. He is true to His covenant and He will remain true to his covenant people. And even the time frame when Isaiah was writing was dark and depressing because they were in bondage to their enemy. God had a promise of hope for a better tomorrow. And because Israel, even though they were, they were in bondage because of their disobedience, I've said this many times, Christian can also be in bondage to his enemy because of his disobedience. But just as it was for Israel, so it is for Christian. There is a promise for a prosperous tomorrow. My point number one was the moment of darkness. Let's look at Isaiah 54, 1. And then we're going to look at verses 7 and 8. And this is where I got the title, Singing in the Rain. Because he said, sing, O barren. Barren means empty. It's like a, a dry desert. Nothing's growing. You that did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You that did not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. Look at verses 7 and 8. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee in a little wrath. I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, says the Lord, your Redeemer. When God's people are in the midst of a turmoil, which is connected to a test or even the result of sin, it's hard to see the light and the hope that lies ahead. You know, for King David, he called it the valley of the shadow of death. For Samson, it was literal darkness as his eyes were gouged out and he was grinding at, the, at that mill. For Jesus, it was when our sin was on him and the presence of the Father was removed for a moment. A barren woman in Israel was a disgrace. God had purchased Israel through that Abrahamic contract or covenant with her. And, and, and he had sealed the deal through his covenant with Moses. But like an unfaithful wife, she had gone her own way and cheated on him. But God is merciful. This is what he spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 3, 14. Jeremiah was considered somewhat of a contemporary of Isaiah, meaning that their ministries overlapped a little bit. They were in a similar time frame during all of this disobedience. And this is what the Lord speaks to Jeremiah. He says, Turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you, one of a city, two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, which is another name for Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to bring you back. It, it, God would say, I'm married to you, and even though you're far away, I will bring you back. I just want you to turn and come back to me. Even though you may feel like my presence is far from you, even though the place where you are seems dark, repent and turn to me. That's what the Lord would say. You're like a, you're like a wife that has gone her own way, that has been unfaithful. You're far away, but if you'll recognize it, you'll turn from it. And you'll come back to me, I will have you, and I will restore you. That was point number one. It goes pretty fast from this point. Mm -hmm. Point number two. It doesn't matter how far his people have gone. He knows where to find them and how to bring them back. Let's look at verses 5 and 7 now. Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah 43, verses 5 and 7, another chapter. 
People are far away. This is what the Lord says. Fear not, for I am with you. His people were far away, right? They were in Babylon. They were captive. He says, I will bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Sometimes God's people feel so far away. I don't know if that's ever been you before, but I know I've felt that way. So far away from God that they begin to feel hopeless and that there's no way back. But King David said this, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. Amen. You know, the, the word rod, it, it's many times, the, there's times in the Bible where rod and staff are the same thing. It's just used for two different purposes. The, you know, the rod would also had the little crook neck thing where they could reach over there and they could snatch the, the sheep. But the rod was also used for correction, like in the book of Proverbs, spare not the rod, right? Spo you know, spoil the sp child. spare the rod, spoil the child. Okay, the rod described correction. So for a shepherd, the rod, he would have to use the rod sometimes to bring correction to the sheep. I know I've talked to people before about the analogy of how a good shepherd would sometimes break the leg of a sheep that didn't know any better. It's this crazy little sheep, he's so cute, but he keeps on running off. He keeps on running off, and one day I'm not going to be there to save him, and he's going to get devoured by a wolf. you got to break his leg. And he'd carry him on his neck until it mended. And hopefully by that time, that little sheep would have learned some things. The rod of correction. Sometimes there's things in our lives that are going on and God uses that rod as a rod of correction. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, sometimes things are dark and I can't see. I'm in the midst of the turmoil. I seem so far away. It seems like I'm not going to ever come back. God knows where we are. He uses that staff or that rod to correct, but a staff, one of the purposes of a staff was that it was for support, at least for the person that was using it to walk with it. And the word comfort, the word comfort in, in Hebrew, you know what it means? It's like a sigh. You know, whenever you sigh, sometimes it's because a burden's been rolled on. A burden has been relieved. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. <clears throat> I know the God that I'm in covenant with. He will bring correction to my life. He will give me the support where I need it. But in addition to that, when it's all said and done, when he's done with me, he will lift the burdens off of me. Amen. Back to Isaiah 43 verses 5 through 7. His people were scattered. East, west, north, south. And he said that I'm going to bring them from the east and the west. From the north and the south. Even from all the ends of the earth. God knew where his people were. And he knew how to bring them back. And he makes the point that those that are called by his name. Have a purpose. He, he said the purpose was that they would bring him glory. They bore his name and God's purpose for his people is that they would bring him glory. That's why that's one of the reasons why he's so committed to us, because we as we profess him, we bring glory to his name in the midst of a fallen, wicked world that doesn't know him. You do know this world is wicked, right? I know sometimes that we love it, certain aspects of it anyway. Certain things, we get confused sometimes. I mean, sometimes we hate it, right? Sometimes we don't want no more of it. We're like, oh, Lord, please hurry up. Get me out of here. But sometimes we can get caught up in it. This world is wicked. And God has always had a plan that he would have a people that would, rep that would represent him. And that through them, it would bring him glory. But that's one of the things that Satan always tries to do to the child of God when he or she has walked outside of the will of God. Satan desires to make God's people feel like they're so far away that they'll never be able to come back. Oh, I've gone too far this time. He's a liar. Look at John chapter 8 verses 43 through 47. I just wanted to make a point here. It's kind of a long passage to make the point, but I'm going to do it. John 8, 43 through 47. I'm making the point that Satan is a liar. <laughs> Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. You remember who the Pharisees were, right? They were one of those religious groups. I mean, look what Jesus says to these religious folk. Why do you not understand my speech? Jesus, I'm talking to you, 
but I can tell by your eyes you don't perceive what I'm saying. I'm putting a little bit in there. It's like, you ever had a conversation with somebody and you can tell they don't get it? <laughs> Why do you not understand what I'm saying? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. In other words, that's his language. I used to have a friend. I was talking to somebody about that the other day. He used to have a friend. I don't know. I doubt he watches the videos. If you do, I love you. I'm not going to say your name. But that dude, everything that came out of that dude's mouth was a lie. <laughs> I don't think I said this story the other day, but one day they came and picked me up after I was a Christian. They called me up and they said, man, we're going to Tahoma. So-and-so's parents are out of town. We're going over there to party. We're picking you up. And man, I knew why I got in the car. I don't know, but I did. Anyway, I was in this barroom thing and I'm talking to this girl and whatever. And he walks up. This is what he does. Now, I ain't never owned a car till I was. Well, that's not true. I did. I had a vehicle. But, but anyway, my daddy had to give me the vehicle. And by this time, I had already messed the thing up. But I ain't never owned a Z28, that's for sure. So he walks up to me. He goes, hey, man, you getting your, your car out of this? Like, trying to talk. Like, it flew this girl. Like, I got some guy. I'm like, dude. And I told her right there in front of the girl. Like, dude, I ain't got no Z28. What are you talking about? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? Everything you say that comes out of your mouth. I didn't say all this because he was actually could beat me up. But everything you say that comes out of your mouth is a lie. You're like the devil. That's all the devil knows how to speak is lies. Yeah. Right? He says there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. I think that's important. He that is of God hears God's words. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. That's what Satan does, right? He kills and he lies. He never tells the truth. And people that don't know God can't properly perceive his words. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. People that don't know God cannot perceive the word of God. The Pharisees could not understand what Jesus was saying because they weren't connected to the Lord. The main point that I'm trying to make to you today is this, is that you're never too far. It's never too dark. It's never too late to come back to the Lord. Whoever said so maybe somebody's watching on the camera, film, whatever the case. We need to be reminded of this. But yet the devil will try to lie to you and tell you that you're too far away. You've gone too far. You'll never come back this time. But as the child of God, that's not what the word of God says. We need to be able to hear the word of God. But not only can he, look, look at 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man, that's talking about the man in his natural state that doesn't have his spirit man awakened to the Lord. In other words, you're, he's not a believer. The natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why before you get saved, I mean, listen, we will all admit that there's some unbelievers that are more aware of the spiritual, you know, the things of God, more open to discussing things connected to God. And then there's been people that you've had conversations with that aren't saved that are, that, I mean, it's just like a brick wall. They can't perceive it. Okay. But I want you to know it's easy for the Satan to lie to the unbeliever, but for the Christian, we can hear his word, but it doesn't mean that we always do hear it properly. I wasn't going to go there, but go to 1 Corinthians 3 1. This is just like three verses later than 1 Corinthians 2 14. Look what Paul says to the church in Corinth. He says, But I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as babes in Christ. One of the things that, that the book of Corinthians has always pointed out to me, just because, listen, I want to see the gifts of God flowing in the church. I think that's a good thing. I'm all about the spiritual gifts. But the church of Corinth was full of spiritual gifts. The apostle Paul actually said, you come behind no man. You're lacking in no gift. But he says, you're carnal. You're carnal. And I got to talk to you like a babe in Christ because you cannot perceive the spiritual things. You're still, even though you're flowing in the gifts of the Spirit, you're over here fussing and fighting over, I like the way Paul preaches. I like the way Peter preaches. I like the way Apollos preaches. He says, you're carnal. That is not the mindset of spirituality. 
right? The Lord had to use that to rebuke me before because that's how I was. I was a Lord. I'm not going to get into all that, but the Lord rebuked me before using Bob Cornell, you know, in, the, in that sense one time. I've, I think I've shared that before. But it was like when I first met Sean and not first met him, but first started talking to Sean and them about the Lord. And we also were talking about Sunlight Radio. And all of a sudden, Sean, and I wasn't able to catch the radio station anymore. And all of a sudden, Sean started talking about Bob Cornett, Cornell. Well, I was, I was connected to that stuff long before Bob Cornell was there. That's what, the, you know, self-righteous. I'm just being honest with you. Like, who's this Bob Cornell guy? I'm, I'm a Warren, you know? And, and anyway, so I go to a camp meeting one time and Bob's preaching. And the Lord used him about in that scripture where it says that he who doesn't deny himself and follow after, you know, pick up his cross and follow after me, can't, you know, paraphrase and it can't follow, is not, you know, whatever, not following me. And he made a comment about the fact that the Lord's cross is our cross. And, but the way that he said it, it was like the Holy Spirit gave me revelation at that moment. And at that moment, spoke to my heart and said, how you like that? He just taught you something. <laughs> and, and what the whole, really the whole lesson was about humbling me and showing me how self-righteous I was in the way that I was thinking regarding that type of thing. I was carnal. Even though I was a Christian, even though I was baptized in the Holy Ghost, even though I spoke another tongue, even though I did all of these things, studying the scriptures and knew a lot about the word of God, I was carnal in that mindset. I was fleshly. I was selfish. It still happens to Christians is the point that I'm trying to make. But as the children of God, we're supposed to be able to understand the word of God. And the word of God says you're not too far. You're not too far away to come back. But that's what the enemy would have you to believe. Look at Romans 8.1. The enemy might try to make you feel guilty, but the word of God says... There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If you're in Christ, you're no longer guilty. If you're in him, there's no verdict of condemnation over your life. Look at 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. <clears throat> just like he said through the prophet Jeremiah, come back to me. Amen. God is faithful that if we will repent, if we will confess, the word confess, I said this a while back, homologia, say the same. If we will say the same thing about our sin as God says, he's faithful to cleanse us. Amen. From all unrighteousness. God is faithful to his people. He has a promise for Israel and he has a promise for us today. All right. Point number three. From tragedy to triumph. Look at, look at Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Two, two big things right there. Number one, the word heritage and regarding God's people's righteousness. Heritage is literally an inheritance. It's an inheritance when you're the child of God that people that come against you, try to form a weapon against you, speak against you, that God will condemn it. God will not allow that weapon to prosper against you. He is our protector. He will go to battle for us. And all of this, once again, is based on the fact of righteousness. But it has to do with the fact that our righteousness is from him. Amen. Amen. He wastes nothing. And I can assure you that if you ask any Christian that has ever been far away from the Lord and then walk close with him again, they will tell you that God used that experience to convince them that whatever it was they thought that they were going to get. Look, whatever Israel thought that they were going to get by serving Babylonian gods, once they were in Babylon, I can assure you they didn't want it anymore. They now were in the midst of a place where there was no, all it was was false gods. They were now in a place where they didn't have access to the temple. They didn't have access to the altar. They didn't have access to the sacrifice and to be able to worship the Lord. Now they were captive. 
And there's many times that God will allow his people to go in a certain direction for one of the reasons to prove to them that what they thought that they wanted wasn't really what they wanted after all. It results in causing them, right, to, to get a revelation that whatever they were seeking after that God is, is, is much, he far surpasses all of those things. What Satan means for bad in our lives, God uses to teach us and to train us. He says, every tongue that rises against you shall not prosper. It shall be condemned. And you know, it's true that sometimes Satan will use people and their plans to wreak havoc in our lives. What you talking about? Well, has anybody ever talked bad about you since you've been a Christian? <laughs> sometimes it's good to make it real. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes we can, sometimes we speak so spiritual. One of the things that I realized the more longer I'm a preacher is that you can speak about spiritual concepts and when you're when you're writing it and thinking about it, you're thinking in your mind about a lot of literal things that go on in people's lives, things that have gone on in your own life, things that but but yet at the same time, it's kind of funny how people won't apply it to their own lives. You know what I'm saying? And like sometimes I know that and don't get me wrong, I know we need the help of the Holy Spirit to convict the heart. And whenever the Holy Spirit's moving, he will apply that particular thing to our life. But sometimes it's good to just kind of like break it down and, and make it real. And right here, God is saying he's going to condemn the tongue that comes against his people. And all I'm trying to say is, is that there's a lot of times that there's people in the world that will try to condemn God's people with their tongue. And sometimes they... There's things that are going on in the lives of God's people that give them a right to say various things, right? Um, they may say things and do things in an attempt to destroy us, but God says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And the world loves nothing better, right, than to come against... You, you ever seen how, like, whenever you try... You're, you're desiring to witness to someone at work or wherever you may be. And we all know that we have personality flaws. And, you know, I've been around a lot of people that I've talked to about the Lord and that other Christians have talked to about the Lord. And then on the, on the, on the backside, you know, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, all they want to do is they want to pick apart to me what certain aspects of that other person's life. And I'm sure and they're going back to that other person and they're trying to pick apart aspects of my life. You're, we're never going to fix all of that. A lot of times, our, just our presence and talking about the Lord convicts them. we got to leave all that back up to the Lord. But one of the things that we're promised here is that God will be our defense. Amen. And many times it's difficult for us to release that to the Lord. I just want to say that his victory, it's his victory, not ours. And it's his righteousness, not ours. Amen. I want to close with this last passage of scripture out of Romans 8. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? We're talking about triumph from tragedy to triumph right now. And the fact that God allows us to go through things to bring us to the place where he can set us up for the victory. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So things on earth, those spiritual things we were talking about earlier, fallen angels, demon spirits, can't keep us from the will of God. As long as we're in covenant with him and we're trusting in him, his power goes to work for us. His power goes to war for us. And the scripture says that we're more than conquerors. This word in the, in the Greek, I wanted to look it up. Hyper Nikeo. Hyper. I mean, nowadays we connect it to uh, 
a lot of times in children, ADHD, right? I see kids all the time coming to the clinic, and bang, 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 hyperactivity, above and beyond that which is normal, right? That's what this victory is. It's above and beyond that which is expected. It's above and beyond that which is normal. The Bible says that we have a victory that is above and beyond anything that we could have ever put our mind around because we're, the, the fact that we are more than conquerors is because of the fact that we are in Him. It's through Him and His victory that we've been given this victory. Going back to whenever, you know, Robert used to say, if the Lord move His hand, but when it back this way, but if the Lord move His hand this way, it's a You didn't even, go, I used to, I remember one time I read something, or at least maybe I thought, I thought it. When I first read this scripture and I got the idea behind it, it was kind of like, I remember I used to say this a lot however many years ago that was, when I would preach, when I first started preaching. It's kind of like, you don't even, really and truly, they just split the ropes. You know how sometimes they'll split the ropes? I mean, they did a lot in wrestling. I don't know if they do it a lot in boxing. They'll make a big scene about it. When they split the ropes and the guy steps in there and he gets ready to go to fight. Well, it's kind of like now the ropes are being split and you're just walking up in there and you're grabbing the belt. It's like you're not even really ha fighting the true fight. I mean, yes, there's a battle. There's a daily battle where we trust in God. Amen. But the point is, is that the war has already been won. Yeah. Jesus has already conquered. So therefore, the, 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 the victory that we have is above and beyond that which you would have expected because you're not the one that's having to fight or to win the war. The war's already been, it's a hyper Nikeo. It's a above and beyond the victory that you would have expected. So even though bad... Bad things happen, and sometimes God's people find themselves off the path. It's never too late. It's never too late. It's never too far. God knows where we are. He knows how to bring us back, and he knows how to give us victory through it all.